Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we're about to play Goo Gong. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. As I go over everything, feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. For your convenience, I've added timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial. Also, my copy of the game uses the Kickstarter Deluxe upgraded components. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Gu Gong takes place in 1570 during the Ming Dynasty. In this period of time, China had experienced a lot of corruption, so the new Longqing Emperor set out to reform the government, which included prohibiting monetary bribes. The emperor ruled at the Forbidden City in Beijing, known as Gu Gong, or the Imperial Palace. Under his reign, the Great Wall was rebuilt, fortified, and expanded. With bribery punishable by death, a new custom emerged instead, the exchange of gifts. Now, petitioners presented gifts to officials, which they presented a gift to them in return. This gift exchange custom is the basis for the Gugong board game's game mechanics. Players will take on the role of powerful Chinese families trying to gain influence and power through exchanging gifts with officials in the Imperial Palace. To win the game, players must gain an audience with the Emperor and have the most victory points among those who reached the Emperor. Let's look at how to set it up. Start out by laying the game board face up in the middle of the table. One side is for one to three players and the other for four to five players. Roll the three destiny dice and place them in the spaces for them at the top of the board. Place the day tracker disc on the first space of the day track. It keeps track of the rounds. Find the travel tokens and remove the following bonus travel tokens. These should only be used with experienced players and never combined with any of the Panjun expansion modules. Shuffle the rest of the travel tokens and place them randomly out in the spaces for them on the trail. Then flip them face up. Stack the remaining tokens in two face down drop piles in the corner. Place the blue metal token here on the Intrigue track. Sort out the gift cards by the symbols in the upper right corner. Seven gift cards have a blank fan, which will be the starting cards on the board at the beginning of the game. Shuffle these and one face up in each of the seven card spaces around the board. Randomly determine a first player and give them the gold start player marker. Play will always go clockwise, so the next player clockwise is the second player. The starting player cards are distinguished by how much of the fan is filled in. The four cards with the first segment filled in are for the first player. The four cards up to the second segment of the fan are for the second player. Continue sorting these out in this manner to the third, fourth, and fifth players. The remaining gift cards have a yin-yang symbol in the corner. Shuffle these together and keep it in a face-down deck near the board. Place the jade tokens on each of the blank spaces for them in this area of the board. The extras will sit on the board in this large area. Separate the decree tiles into their level 1, 2, and 3 stacks. Shuffle each stack and draw two from each to use in your game. The two level 1 decrees are placed here, the two level 2 decrees above them, and the two level 3 decrees to the left. The extra decree tiles won't be used and can be returned to the box. Each player should choose a color to be from the five available. Take all the wooden pieces, player board, and the three cardboard Grand Canal ships in your chosen color. Place your traveler piece near the board by the travel locations. Everyone should add their envoy token at the starting spot of the Palace of Heavenly Purity track. Add everyone's intrigue marker on the starting space of the intrigue track. They should be placed in order from top to bottom matching the game's starting turn order. Whichever color is ahead on this track or on top of the stack will be able to break all ties throughout the game. Everyone's victory point marker starts at zero on the victory point track. Each player adds their one double servant piece on the bottom left of their player board. Everyone should have 12 servants in their color. At the start of the game, six of them are placed on the board in this area. Any servants on the board here are usable and available to the player during the game. 
As they are spent, they're removed from the board and set back in a player's general supply. And with that, you're set up and ready to play. Gugong has four rounds, each representing a day. During each day, there's the morning phase, day phase, and night phase. You'll see each of these phases represented at the top of the main board and on each player board. The icons and symbols shown indicate what to do and in what order. So a single round progresses across each step shown at the top of the board one by one from left to right. The morning phase can be skipped in the first round of the game since you've already set up the game. On rounds two through four, you'll be preparing the board for the new day. First, determine who the next start player is. Whoever took the start player blue medal will now take the gold start player marker and return the blue medal to the board near the intrigue track. Next, look at the empty city spaces in the travel area at the top of the board. Any empty spots are refilled with new travel tokens from the tops of the stacks. You won't add tokens underneath a player's traveler. Then re-roll all three destiny dice and place them back in their designated spots. After rolling, you'll check the decrees on the board with the morning symbol. Any players that have claimed the decree will get the shown morning benefit now. The last step in the morning phase is to move the round marker forward on the day tracker. Next to the round number is printed a number of servants that each player gains. Take them from your personal supply and add them to your player board servant area. The day phase is when players will get to take actions using their gift cards. The board is separated into seven regions. Each card location represents an official overseeing one of the main functions of the Chinese state. By exchanging cards with them, each official provides a different set of actions. Start with the current first player and go clockwise, letting each person exchange one of their gift cards in their hand with one on the board. The collected cards from the board will go face down on your board's discard pile. Continue this process until everyone spent all their cards from their hand. Generally, to take the action shown at the card's location, the card from the player's hand must be a higher value than the one on the board. If it's equal to or less than the card on the board, then you may simply exchange the cards and not take an action. Alternatively, you may spend two servants from your supply to still take the action, or discard another card from your hand straight to your player board to take the action. Some gift cards have actions or benefits shown on them. If the card you placed on the board shows an action or benefit, you may do that action in addition to the action provided by the board's location. You don't have to, but if you want to use the card's ability, it must be done first. You may also choose to only do the card's action and not the board space. Once all players have played out their hand of cards, you'll move into the night phase. Each player should now reveal their collected gift cards in their discard pile. For each numbered card that matches a die, take one servant per matching die for it. For example, should two destiny dice have the same number, each matching card yields two servants. These servants earned are moved from their general supply to their player boards. Any unused servants from the previous round are kept on their player board and not discarded. If you don't have servants in your general supply, any earned servants would be forfeited. Whichever player earned the most servants from matching cards will gain three victory points and advance their envoy one space forwards toward the Emperor. Next, all ships on the Grand Canal move one step forward. Start with the ship furthest in the lead. As a full ship enters a new harbor space, that player may choose to claim the reward of the harbor. A ship is full if all three squares on it are covered by servants. I'll explain how to take the harbor rewards later. Any ship that was at the end of the canal will get lost at sea. The player takes back the ship and any servants back to their general supply. After moving all the ships and taking any rewards, you'll immediately start again with the morning phase. If at the end of the fourth day, though, you'll proceed to end-game scoring. The center of each player board shows what extra points are earned at the end of the game. I'll explain each later, but for now, take a look at the purple icon shown. Anywhere you see this purple icon with numbers, it means points earned at the end of the game. When you see the red icon with the more rounded border, it refers to victory points immediately earned. 
Now that you understand how the game proceeds, let's look at all the locations on the board and their actions. Each location has an icon and color specific to it, which will also be referenced on the gift cards. The first location I'll go over is the one most important to winning, the Palace of Heavenly Purity. The icon for it is this purple one. The envoys start at the bottom of the track and must make their way to the top where the Emperor is. Between each of the white lines is a space to move. You do not qualify to win unless you get your envoy to the end of this track by the end of the game. The actions possible are shown underneath the card space. You can choose one of them to do. The top action shown lets you advance your envoy one space upwards on the track. The bottom action requires you to first spend two servants, then advance your envoy two steps forward. Then you may move your intrigue marker forward one on the intrigue track. When you move to the topmost space, you place your envoy in the highest point value spot available. So the first person to get there will earn the most in-game points from it. If you've reached the top space and gain more advancements, you'll get one immediate victory point for each step. The Jade location has a green icon attached to its card space. By exchanging a gift card here, you'll be able to take exactly one Jade per action. Jade is not used for anything during the game, but is worth victory points at the end. The more you collect, the more they're worth, as shown by the table at the bottom of your player board. To collect Jade, spend a number of servants equal to the cost shown above its house. At the start of the game, all the Jade houses are full, so you may take the Jade from the cheapest spots. They are never replenished. Once the cheapest jade tokens have been taken, all jade at this spot will cost 5 servants. The expensive jade is meant to be unlimited. You can keep the jade on your player board or somewhere near you for the end of the game. You may exchange gifts with the shady official to climb up the intrigue track, which represents your family's hidden influence in the Forbidden City. The intrigue track resolves any tiebreaker during the game. There are two possible actions at this location. The top action lets you move your Intrigue marker forward on the track one spot and take the next start player medal token if present. Only one player per day can take it, so if it's gone, you're out of luck. By taking it, that player will be the first player during the next day. The second action possible here costs one servant, but lets you increase your Intrigue three steps. If your marker reaches the same space as one or more opponent workers, place yours on top. Being on top is considered ahead in terms of breaking ties. You may not go higher than 14 on this track. Intrigue can also be spent on rewards when the Great Wall scores. At the Great Wall, you can assist the Public Works official in renovating sections of the wall. By exchanging a gift card here, you can add servants on the Great Wall track. Servants are always added to the leftmost open space. The first action option here is to place one servant from your available servants on the wall. The second action option is to spend one servant from your board to add two other servants to the wall. The wall will be completed as soon as the space below the player count number is filled. When that happens, immediately proceed to scoring the Great Wall. You may fully complete a single action before scoring the wall. So if it only takes one more servant to complete it, you may do the second action option to add two and then score the wall. To score, look at who has the most servants on the wall. Ties are always broken by the intrigue track. The player with the most then gains three victory points and moves their envoy up on the heavenly purity track. Then they collect all their servants on the great wall back to their general supply. All remaining player servants slide down to the left filling empty spaces. Then players who had servants on the wall when it scored may earn an intrigue benefit. Start with the player with the least amount of intrigue. These players are allowed to spend their intrigue on one benefit as shown at the top here. Spend the amount shown next to the benefit to gain it. Just move your intrigue marker backwards on the track the number of steps to pay for it. For one intrigue, you may gain one servant from your general supply to your available servants pool. Spend three to gain two servants. You may spend five intrigue to choose one destiny die and turn it to any side you want. The dice may be adjusted multiple times by different players in a single great wall scoring. Lastly, you could spend seven intrigue to gain one jade from the jade supply. 
These must always come from the most expensive house jade supply. No servants need to be spent. The topmost location on the board is the travel area where you may exchange gifts with the revenue official and move your traveler to cities around China to collect taxes for the emperor. The first action available here is to move your traveler once in any direction following the white dotted lines. The first time you take the travel action, you may place your token on any travel token spot, which will count as your first move. When your traveler lands on a travel token, you may take it and place it above your player board. You may choose to immediately earn the depicted benefit or wait till a later turn. The second action available lets you spend two servants to move twice. You may take two travel tokens this way. When moving, you don't count empty city sites in your movement. Also, skip over and ignore other players' travelers. Any spent travel tokens should be flipped face down above your player board. You may collect and hold six at a time. Any others collected must be immediately turned in for rewards. At any time during the game, you may turn in a number of collected travel tokens for specified rewards. You may turn in two travel tokens to gain one servant from your supply to your player board. You may spend four to immediately gain two victory points, or you can exchange six travel tokens to take one jade from the supply. Place these spent travel tokens in a discard pile near the board. Don't mix them with the draw piles. If needing to add more travel tokens during the morning phase and the draw stacks are empty, shuffle the discard tokens into new stacks and keep drawing from there. The back of the rulebook includes a list of all the travel tokens and what they do if you're not sure. You can exchange gifts with the decrees official in this area of the board, giving you ongoing advantages during the game. Each decree does something different. All the various decrees that could be in your game are listed and described in the back of the rulebook on page 19. All the level 1 decrees gain you a morning phase benefit, while all the level 3 decrees give you in-game points. Each player may claim each decree once. By claiming a decree after others have claimed it, your cost goes up. Each decree shows a cost in the bottom left corner. Add the printed cost to any opponent's servants present at the decree to find the total cost to claim the decree. After paying it, then use another servant to occupy the decree. After claiming a decree, gain any victory points shown on the left and a red icon. The purple icon is only points earned at the end of the game. From then on, you will gain the decree's advantage for the rest of the game. The seventh area of the board is the Grand Canal, found along the bottom of the game board. By exchanging a gift with the trade official, you will send servants on a boat journey on the Grand Canal to trade with those living outside Beijing. There are three kinds of rewards earned on the river. The top action shown lets you place one servant on one of your ships in the canal and move one of your ships forward. Each player has three ships, so they may have up to three ships on the board at a time. A ship must have a servant on it, so the first time you do this action, you must add a ship to the canal with the servant. Adding a ship to the board like this is not considered movement, so you may choose to immediately move it forward. The board side for four to five players separates the Grand Canal into two. You may choose either one to place your ship. They are functionally identical. Either way, when adding a ship to the board, it must be added to the leftmost open space of the canal track. On a later action, you could put a servant on a ship already there and move it too. You don't have to move the ship you placed a servant on. Both of these steps are optional, so you can do the action of moving the ship without placing a servant, or vice versa. When moving, you follow the white dotted line and occupy the next empty space, so you would skip over any spots occupied by other players' ships. The second possible action lets you pay one servant to add two servants to a ship already on the canal. You may put one servant on two ships if you want to. The servants occupy the free spaces outlined on the ship token. To claim a reward shown at a harbor space, you must have filled the ship completely. This means having three normal servants or one normal with one double servant. The double servant is one of the rewards available. After taking the Grand Canal action or after your ship has automatically moved at the end of the day, you may claim the reward of the ship's destination harbor. Remove the ship and the servants, putting them back in your general supply. However, use one of these servants to sit on the left of your board in the notch for the reward taken. Each reward has a limited amount of times it can be taken. 
The double servant can only be gained once, shown by the fact that there's only space for one servant next to it in the notch on the left. The double servant is immediately placed in your available servant pool. This reward icon means to gain an extra gift card. You may immediately draw one from the top of the deck set aside at the beginning of the game. Having an extra card will allow you to have an extra action each day. The reward may be taken twice. The victory point icon is the reward that immediately earns you four victory points. It can be earned three times. Having the double servant available is very helpful to use to quickly fill up a ship or quickly fill the Great Wall. Using it counts as one servant, but it will occupy two spaces. When it's removed, it returns to your general supply and may be chosen as your next earned servant whenever you should gain servants. The end of the game happens after the fourth round once all the ships have moved and players have taken any final rewards from them. Follow the final scoring procedure outlined in the center of each player's personal board. First, the Great Wall will score again as long as there are servants on it. It does not need to be full like it usually would. The player with the most servants on it gains three victory points and advances their envoy one space on the palace track. Remember, if your envoy is at the top of the track already, you'll gain a victory point per advancement. This final advancement on the track can allow that player to be qualified to win if they weren't already at the top. Next, check the level 3 decrees that provide in-game points. Any players that claim them will now get to earn the points provided based on how each one scores. Check the back of the rulebook for the full list of each decree's scoring method. Next, players will get awarded points from the Palace of Heavenly Purity. Gain the points shown for where the envoy is sitting. Lastly, each player will gain points based on how much jade they've collected. The chart will show you how many points are gained. So if you have 5 jade, you'll get 15 points. Each jade past 5 is worth 2 points each. Remove any player's victory point token if their envoy hasn't reached the top spot of the palace. They cannot win. Of the remaining players with victory points, the player with the most points at the end of the game is declared the most influential Chinese family. If there's a tie for victory points, check the Intrigue track to break the tie. There is an expert variant that is recommended after you've played a couple games. The change comes during setting up. Instead of using the starting seven gift cards with the blank fan icon, shuffle them with the yin yang cards first. If playing with less than the full five players, also shuffle those players starting four cards in as well. Deal out seven randomly into the starting seven gift card locations on the board. Then play the game as normal. Gugong may be played completely solo by using the Automa cards. The AI opponent is named Mung. Mung acts like a normal player, but with some exceptions. His gift cards may always be exchanged for their full actions, regardless of the printed value. Additionally, his servants are used during an added twilight phase of the day, and Mung will focus on one official's action, especially by request of the Emperor. Set up the game like normal for a two-player game, giving Mung his own color and player board. However, before placing the starting gift cards on the board, deal one and remember the number. Then, randomly place all seven on the board. Wherever the number shows up on the board, place Mung's double servant there next to the card. This will be the action he focuses most on during the game. Before shuffling the travel tokens, remove the ones known as the bonus travel tokens. There are three kinds to look for and remove. You and Mung must use a specific set of starting cards. There's a table that shows the possible set combinations. Shuffle Mung's cards and place them face down next to his player board. Pull out the special cards. For an easy game, use only one of these in an Automa deck. For a normal game, use all the Automa cards, including both special cards. For a hard game, also let Mung begin with a fifth gift card drawn from the Yin Yang deck. Now shuffle the Automa deck and place it face down near Mung's player board. Grab five servants from a third color to be used to track Mung's harbor rewards. As the human player, you always begin the game going first. During the morning phase, treat Mung like a normal player, giving him earned rewards or transferring the start player token to him if he, it was earned. During the day, Mung will keep taking turns as long as he has gift cards remaining. On Mung's turn, reveal the top Automa card and the topped gift card. The top area of the Automa card indicates where Mung exchanges his card on the board. 
the values of the cards are irrelevant for Mung. Place the taken card on his player board like normal. Mung will always take the action at no additional cost. Mung will perform the card's action or gain its benefit if possible. If the card benefit is swapping cards, give him one victory point instead. Then Mung resolves doing the board action. Keep the played Automa cards in a face-up stack for the day. Whenever his draw deck is empty, reshuffle the discards from the previous days, but leave the current day's cards set aside. Before the night phase, Mung's servants will be used in a new twilight phase. Turn the played Automa cards of this day face down. Reveal one at a time and take the bottom action shown on the card. The bottom area is the twilight action and generally upgrades Mung's day actions or gains him a free travel step. Any acquired harbor bonus gift cards goes to his discard pile. If Mung doesn't have the servants required or travel tokens to turn in, he skips the card and goes to the next one. Go through each one of these and then add the Automa cards to the discard pile for the previous days. At night, Mung will gain servants when checking for gift cards matching the destiny dice. However, the amount of matches and servants Mung earns is automatically determined. In day one, he gains one servant. In day two, two servants, three in day three, and four in day four. These numbers also compete with the human player's matched cards to determine who gains the Destiny Dice Award. As Mung takes actions during the day, he'll do the simpler A action, which is the one on top available at the different locations. During Twilight, Mung will perform the B action, which is the stronger bottom half. Additionally, any time Mung doesn't have enough servants to do an action, he must exchange travel tokens, if possible, to gain more. I won't explain how Mung takes each individual action differently, as you can reference the solo rule page easily as needed. However, I'll cover the basics. When taking the travel action, his traveler starts in the bottom right corner and moves counterclockwise around the outer edge of the map, gaining the rewards of the travel tokens and servants as any player would. There are some special cases. If Mung should gain six travel tokens, he should immediately turn them in for a jade. During Great Wall scoring, Mung will prioritize trying to gain a jade if possible. If not possible, but still has intrigue, Mung will spend one to gain one servant. At the Decrees location, Mung spends servants to claim a decree at the usual cost. Mung will go for the cheapest option among the two decrees of a level matching the day. So, he looks at the two level 1 decrees in day 1, the level 2 decrees in day 2, and the level 3s in days 3 and 4. Only if he can't afford to take the cheap decree for the matching level, then Mung starts considering lower level decrees. He'll always take a decree if there's one he can afford. At the Grand Canal during the day, Mung places one servant on an existing ship or starts a new one if not. Mung never moves his own ships. They only move during the night phase. Mung automatically claims the harbor reward as soon as his ship has three servants. Regardless of the harbor specified reward, Mung takes the rewards in a specific order. First and second rewards are a new gift card. Don't take a second gift card if you started him on hard difficulty. Every reward after that is four victory points. Mark the rewards earned on his player board with the neutral third color servants. There is no limit to the amount of times Mung can earn the four point reward, but still place a max of three servants in the notches. Anytime Mung's Automa card is the special card, Mung takes the preferred action determined at the start of the game. Mung's double servant is there to mark it. If the gift card played allows Mung to take the same board location action, then he'll do option B instead without paying its costs, or using servants from his general supply if necessary. Check the solo rules for the special cards to see how this plays out for each location. Final scoring is the same for a normal game, except that Mung doesn't have to reach the end of the Palace of Heavenly Purity track to win. He'll only miss out on the victory points for doing so, but still qualifies to win. Gugong recently had an expansion released called Panjun, which expands the game and brings four new modules to add in to the game. It remains fully compatible with the solo mode from the base game, with some changes. Just check the solo area of the new rulebook to see how the AI handles each new action. Panjun is set in 1571 after the Longqing Emperor abandoned his ruling duties to pursue his own personal enjoyment. 
he left the Forbidden City and stayed in the beautiful summer palace surrounded by court ladies. Peasants began demanding the government's help to no avail. Due to his new lifestyle and inaction, the peasants began to revolt. Before I get into the four new modules, there are some extra materials in Panjun that replace or upgrade Gugong's original components. Firstly, there are new player boards you may use instead of the ones that came with the base game. They have been redesigned to have a better, clearer layout with a new area to hold your collected jade tokens. It also adds a new spot to hold the Court Lady token from the Summer Palace and an updated in-game scoring section. In the first printing of Gugong, one of the level 3 decrees and one Yin Yang gift card were printed twice, meaning one of each was missing. In this expansion, you'll find the correct missing decree and gift card. The first module is known as the Summer Palace. Lay out the Summer Palace board next to the bottom right side of the main board. It's double-sided, so make sure to use the side for your number of players. It includes a new gift card location and decree space. Add the game overview strip with the white circle icon on top of the main board covering the night phase. Add in the three new travel tokens from this expansion and remove the bonus travel tokens from the base game. Add in the new gift cards with their respective decks. There's a new starting gift card with a blank fan plus two more with the yin yang symbol. Add the new level one decree tile with the others and shuffle like normal. The new level 4 decrees can be shuffled and placed on the Summer Palace board. There are 20 neutral servants which will be added onto the Summer Palace board. Place 4 per player on the indicated spaces. Extra Jade tokens come with the expansion, so you can add these to the Jade space shown on the Summer Palace. Each player now has a Court Lady token which will sit on the Summer Palace. Shuffle and randomly assign one favorite gift on the space for it on the Palace board return the unused favorites to the box. The new gift card location lets you send servants to the piers on the ponds of the Summer Palace. The top action lets you place one servant from your general supply to one of the piers. The second action option moves your envoy backwards one space to place two servants from your general supply on one or two piers. With the Panjun expansion, it's now possible for your envoy to go backwards on his track. This includes leaving the topmost space, potentially being disqualified from winning. The new travel tokens and decrees are described fully in the rulebook. Whenever a player places a gift card anywhere on the board matching the Emperor's favorite gift, it may trigger pawn scoring. Additionally, during the night phase, you'll trigger pawn scoring after the first two night steps. As long as there are servants on a pier, the pawns can be scored. When scoring the pawns, the player with the most servants at the pier gets the benefit of the pawn. The active player who played the favorite gift card may choose the pawn to score, or not to. After taking the pawn benefit, that player returns their servants to their general supply. Then the others who have servants may choose to remove their servants or let them remain. Go in intrigue order from highest to lowest. The benefits from pawns could be servants, jade, or the court lady. For the servants reward, you gain two neutral servants from the pawn supply to your servant pool. These may only be used to pay for action costs and never placed on the board. Neutral servants spent can be regained from your personal general supply like normal. The court lady may be placed with your gift exchange, and by using her, you may take the gift card's action, the board action, or both again. When you use her like this, immediately return her to the Summer Palace. At the end of the game, if you still own your court lady, you'll gain three victory points. To use the Peasant's Revolt module, add the Peasant's board to the bottom left side of the main game board. Remember to place the side face up matching your number of players. This board depicts the countryside surrounding the Forbidden City and provides a new gift card location as well as another level 4 decree space. It comes with its own set of travel tokens to add into the mix, indicated by the brown background. When using them in this module, don't use the bonus travel tokens from the base game, and you should remove one of each of these five types of travel tokens. Add the extra starting gift card with the white triangle icon with the other starting cards to be dealt out at the beginning of the game. Also add the two extra yin yang gift cards to that deck too. Shuffle the new Peasant's Revolt Decrees and place one face up in its spot on the Peasant's board. 
add in the new level 2 decree and shuffle it in to be randomly drawn like normal on the main board. If the new level 2 decree comes out, place one bid token per player next to the game board. If it doesn't come out, return the bid tokens to the box. Collect and shuffle face down the peasant revolt tokens into a stack on the new board. Depending on player count, a peasant revolt happens when the track with tokens is completed. The gift card location lets you exchange gifts with the official of agriculture to gain help from the countryside peasants. The first action option is to gain two servants and add a peasant revolt token on the track. The second action is to move your envoy backwards one space to gain up to four servants. Then add a peasant revolt token to the track. These are added from left to right, face down. When using this module, anytime a player uses a value 1 gift card to exchange with a value 9 card, the peasants get angry. When this happens, the player must also add a peasant revolt token from the draw pile onto the revolt track. Additionally, anytime someone collects one of the brown travel tokens, they should add a peasant revolt token to the track. Whenever the track is completed, as determined by reaching the player count number shown, a revolt happens at the end of the current player's turn. They'll reveal all the peasant tokens on the track and add up their values. Then each player chooses a card from their discard pile and places it face down in front of them. Players without cards in their discard pile can't participate. Any player with a bid token may choose to use it by sliding it under their card with the plus two or minus two side face up. Add up the player's card's values with any bid tokens used. If the value played by the players is equal to or greater than the value of the peasant's revolt, the peasants fail their revolt. The player who played the lowest value card, combined with their bid token, takes their card back to use again this round. Tied players for this is settled by the intrigue track. All other players return their played card to the discard pile. Should the total of all the players' contributed values be lower than the peasants, then they successfully revolt. In that case, the player who played the highest value takes the card back to their hand to use again this round. All other players return their card to the discard pile and retreat their envoy backwards one step if possible. After resolving the revolt, shuffle all the revolt tokens again into a new draw pile. The Stairs of the Palace module brings new changes to the Palace of Heavenly Purity track. When using this module, add the game overview strip with the white stair symbol to cover the morning phase at the top left of the board. Separate the new palace track boards into matching stacks with these colored icons. Place a random one of each type to the Palace of Heavenly Purity track. Envoys will now have to advance on one of these two tracks to get to the Emperor. During the morning phase, check who has envoys on the right palace track with this symbol. These players must either take the indicated bonus shown or pay the cost, which could be victory points, jade, intrigue, or servants. Anytime they should pay something but can't, they must move their envoy backwards. Envoys will never go more than one space back during the morning phase. They won't gain or pay anything on the newly arrived space. Once a player moves their envoy for the first time, they must choose a track to take. You may never switch tracks unless your envoy was moved backwards to the starting position. The other track on the left has this icon and contains conditions that must be fulfilled as soon as your envoy moves over or on the space. When moving your envoy backwards to a space with a condition, it must still be paid unless it's the result of a penalty, like the Peasant's Revolt. All the rewards, penalties, and conditions found on these tracks are described in detail in the Panjun rulebook on page 7. The final module in the Panjun expansion adds more decrees, travel tokens, and gift cards. These components are all marked with a white half-circle icon. The two new travel tokens can be added to the base game tokens as long as you don't use the bonus travel tokens from the base game. New level 1 and 2 decrees can be used by adding them to the game board before any others. After choosing the new decrees to use, then shuffle any others being used and draw what is needed for the remaining empty spots. There are additional level 4 decrees that could be used in conjunction with the Summer Palace or Peasant Revolt boards. Whenever claiming a level 4 decree, you must immediately move your envoy backwards on the palace track three steps. 
In addition to paying the normal decree costs, the gift cards with the white half circle icon add six more yin yang cards to that deck. However, if adding them, first remove the following six yin yang cards. The new ones will replace them. All of these modules are able to be used independently or together, though it's recommended to try them one at a time first. Combining more of them is recommended for experienced players. As an additional variant, you may choose to include all the expansion yin yang cards at the top of the deck, with the base games below them. That way you're guaranteed to see the new cards first. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. Check the video description for links to Top Shelf Gamer for token upgrades, Cloud Puncher Games for board game shelving, and Mr. Meeple t-shirts for cool board gaming shirts. The Meeple Mentor channel is now part of the board game community, The Gateway Network, made up of great upcoming board game content creators. Originally founded by the Gamecasters podcast, the network includes Instagrammers, podcasters, YouTubers, artists, and even a gamer-themed comedy series. Click the link in the video's description or head over to the Gateway Network's Instagram to find great new content. And thanks for watching this tutorial. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.